so much for joining us and welcome to the 2020 Meet the Press Film Festival at AFI Fest. Now we are less than a month away from the election and as you can see from the Feast films there's really a lot more on the ballot than just the personalities of the two candidates at the top of the ticket. So I'm Morgan Radford, NBC News correspondent and I'm so excited to be joined by Ben Proudfoot. He's the director of The Lost Astronaut and Samantha Knowles, director of Tangled Roots. Uh, let's just jump right into it. Ben, let's start with you. Why did you decide to tell Captain Ed Dwight Jr.'s story? What about it attracted you? Well, thanks for having me. Um, I, you know, so we, the film is part of a series we did with the New York Times called Almost Famous. So we were in the process of finding people who, if history had gone just a little differently, you might well know their name. And so Ed's name came up in the, in the search for, for people like that. We would, you know, search newspaper archives for phrases like, if not for, they would have been stuff like that. And, and that's how we found Ed. And um, when I read about his story, it was amazing. But I, I was particularly drawn to two things. One was this interesting collision of the space race and the civil rights movement, which collided in him. And the other was his second act as a sculptor, um, as a memorial uh, builder and monument builder. Um, and I have a long, long history of making films about craftspeople, mm -hmm. and I just thought, man, there's so many amazing elements to the story. We've got to go to Denver and, and make this film. Yeah, and I'm curious because, you know, I can't help but think about how timely this story was, right? When I was yeah. watching it, you saw it really touch on the element of tokenism, of representation, of exclusion, of rejection. What do you hope that people take away from Captain Dwight's story now? Well, um, to me, to me, his story kind of has two sides to it. One, one side, which is just the reality of the incredible injustice um, that you know, someone who's alive, alive today saw not that long ago in this country. And that's one person's story, right? One individual's story. Um, and that that is real and that it, that is present. And I think, I think you kind of feel the weight of that for him when the tears come to his eyes as he's recalling the story, which I, I you know, even catches me off guard watching it again. Um, and then, you know, I think, I think if I'm thinking about what would Ed say, which is, which is really my job is to give a platform to Ed, is he, his whole philosophy is you can train your brain to help you and you can train your brain to destroy you. And I think his second act, um, which was really diving into African American history and creating these monuments and memorials all across the country is incredibly inspiring, right? I think you could easily um, assume someone who went through something like that could be extremely angry and um, bitter and consumed by that. Um, but he found a way to be extraordinarily productive and make a real difference um, with his art. Well, speaking of productive, I mean, Samantha, we saw this incredible story from this Kentucky state representative, and you really tackled a topic that is something that especially in black spaces, a lot of women and men have talked about how you know natural hair is worn, how it's perceived. But do you think that the process of making this film, that's a topic that is now more understood more widely? Do you think people understand this isn't just about hair? You know, I've, I've really thought about that a lot while I was making this film. And I first was kind of, I, first actually kind of latched onto this topic 15 years ago when I was in high school and I realized that my school had a rule that sort of banned you know certain black hairstyles and looking back then black hair discrimination wasn't even a phrase you know it wasn't even something that was on the radar um, and so I've really seen over the past 
15 years and then with the, you know, and especially over the last year that I've been working on this film, um, it really has reached the mainstream. I think just uh, last month or something, um, I think it was Glamour dedicated an entire issue to black hair. Um, multiple states have, you know, introduced bills like Attica's. Um, and so it's really, really exciting to see this issue be taken seriously because, you know, it, it has been a struggle, you know, I've been wanting to make this film for, for a, a few years now, and it's been a struggle in some cases to convince people that this is an actual issue worth discussing. Um, so yeah, I've definitely seen it change. It's interesting because something that struck me about both of your films was the open, right? Ben, with you, there was that line when he says, you know, how the hell do you become famous for something that you didn't do? And then with you, Samantha, it was the news clips. I mean, they gutted me because you're seeing these young people who were targeted for their, I mean, seeing them literally being cut. And these are moments that were very recent that we remember seeing, clips that went viral. Why did you choose to open that way? Hmm. I, I felt like that opening was really important because I felt like it was really important to lead with, in this film, the pain that is caused by this issue. Um, there have been a lot of viral, you know, there have been a few viral moments. Um, most notably, I think the one that comes to mind for a lot of people is the wrestler in New Jersey whose um, dreadlocks were cut before a wrestling match. And I really wanted, I didn't want to shy away from those kind of painful moments. Um, and so I really wanted early on the audience to understand like this actually causes harm and to know that it was also widespread and then to take a step back and show somebody who was fighting to ban this kind of practice, you know, to ban this kind of discrimination. So it was really important with me to lead with with that kind of emotional opening. That was really, really key for, for me for the film. And it's interesting because even beyond the opening, both of you weren't afraid, you, neither of you shied away from showing the disappointment. And I think that was something that was so raw. I mean, when you see him start crying in your film, Ben, I mean, walk me through that because when I first was watching the film, I'm like, oh my goodness, this is tackling this concept of regret. And then by the middle of the film, I thought, wait, he's talking about fate. This is about fate. And then you see his sculptures, this reveal, and then you think the film was about rebirth. And I thought that transition was so powerful. Did anything about his reaction to his own story surprise you when it came to Mr. Dwight? Hmm. Um, well, I think none of it, I think the one moment when it's when it surprised him is in the movie. I don't. I like he's a he's a very um, he's a great storyteller. He's a great speaker. He's prepared. He's got. He's he's he knows how to tell his story. Um, and I think that moment when a tear came to his eye um, was a surprise for him. And I actually think it's a little more nuanced than simply, he loved flying, right? He loved flying. And when he was escorted off the base, there's, there's really no way to fly as an individual, right? You either have to like work for an airline, be independently wealthy or, or be in the Air Force. And I think he knew he wouldn't fly a plane again. And I think that memory um, was, what, what, was what got him. Um, but I mean, that's what's part, an interesting part of, of being a documentary filmmaker is asking people questions about stuff they haven't thought about in 50 years um, and, and listening. Um, and I think, I think some of those stories that he told, I'm not sure if he had told anybody else. I guess a question for both of you then, how much of a role do you think timing played for, for both of your characters? I, I was thinking, Ben, when I was watching Mr. Dwight, you know, I had previously listened to a, an interview on NPR um, with Bill Lester. He was a black race car driver back in the day. And they were reflecting on Bubba Wallace. And the interviewer asked him, you know, do you think, did you, did you try to make these changes before now? And he's like, yeah, I definitely tried to make them, but the world wasn't ready. How much do you think timing was, was the case for, for both of your characters? Samantha? 
Um, you know, I think that was a really interesting part of, of my film because I feel like for Attica, it was, and for, for me as well, it was constantly a question of like, is the timing right? Mm -hmm. And is it too early or is it, you know, perfect? And, you know, she, we both hoped that it was going to be perfect uh, timing for her. Um, but she's in a state where she's the only black woman state re representative um, currently. And the first in, you know, the 21st century. And I think we both, um, you know, maybe me even more, I think we were hit with the dose of reality of like, okay, the timing is, is the timing on this is still, there's still a lot left to be done, you know, which is something that I know, of course, throughout the entire country. But I think for this issue specifically, it was, we were really kind of hit with that. Um, and there were also a lot of signs that I think underlie that in the film. One notably was, um, you know, we talk about Muhammad Ali as sort of like a theme in the film. And I remember when we, there are, and there are murals all over Louisville of, of him because he's, he's um, from there. And I remember we, we would like every trip, every shoot, we would go see a mural. And finally we went to this one mural and it was defaced. And I remember being like, I, you know, and th this was a moment where we were still wondering if the bill was gonna go through. We were still, you know, curious about what was gonna happen. And I feel like seeing, you know, seeing that mural, which ended up making it in the film, I, I felt like, I was like, you know, I think this is, this feels, um, I don't know if saying it feels like a sign is too, is too dramatic, but it, it felt like resonant mm -hmm. for me in that moment. Um, yeah. But, ben, what about, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the entire series that we're making about, that we are making about folks who are almost famous, timing always plays a huge role. I mean, for Ed in particular, it's interesting because his involvement with NASA and everything was really kicked off by the Kennedy administration, in particular RFK's interest in an African-American astronaut. And before that, you know, I, he wouldn't have even gotten a call, right? He, there, was, there would have been no effort on the other side to make, make progress or, or have fairness in the process. So in many ways, he got caught up in the machinations of, a, of attempting progress, but not really having it all worked out. And Kennedy's assassination plays into that. Um, and so he just got caught in the crosshairs of this, of, of opposing forces. Um, but, but you can also look at timing too of, of, of right now, right? And that, um, you know, it's not like I'm the first to tell Ed's story. He's uh, told his own story in a, in a book. Um, it was an article in the New York Times as well. Um, but I think there's something about his first person testimony um, that's been powerful to people this year. Um, in particular year where we're discussing monuments and um, who they depict, um, there seems to be sort of a fortuitous timing for Ed to tell his story to a wider audience today. And I think the things he talked about, right? I don't know any Black person in America who hasn't felt that moment of exclusion. I don't know any Black person in America who hasn't wondered, you know, if, if my grandparents or my parents had had these opportunities, what could have happened? Um, and I think that was kind of a fascinating for people of color, a very universal feeling, right? Even the tokenism, even the power of seeing the representation when he saw that other black pilot, right? Yeah. The moment that you include him, he's like, oh my gosh, you know, black people can fly. Yeah. What kind of feedback, Samantha, have you heard from other, I mean, within the black community, what have you heard from other black women or black men who, you know, in the process of, of researching and of doing this film? What kind of response have you received? Um, I've received, I've heard a lot from people who are like, thank you for, for calling this an issue, you know, or like, thank you for giving me that language or exposing me to that language of that, that this is like an actual issue. Because I think a lot of people 
experience, you know, this form of discrimination or form or similar forms of discrimination in various ways and they're in at various levels. Um, and, you know, before I had kind of delved into this as as a research topic, I hadn't labeled it as discrimination. Mm. Um, and so I think for a lot of people, they they've kind of come around to the 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 idea that you know, oh, this is a legitimate form of discrimination that somebody is trying to legislate, you know? Um, so I think that's a lot of what I've, what I've heard from people. One of the takeaways I thought was really strong was kind of towards the end, you heard her say, as black folk, we've rarely ever fought battles that have turned around as quickly as we'd hoped. How much of this film for you, Samantha, is about hope? I think a lot of it is, I think, I think a lot of it is, it, it is about that. I mean, I think um, one, my favorite scene in the film is right before that moment that you mentioned when, um, you know, Attica has sort of lost her big battle um, that we follow, but she's won this small victory. Um, you know, this labor union has said, oh, we changed the terms of our contracts based on your fight to end hair discrimination. And I feel like I, I loved that as the ending and I, you know, I included it because I felt like, okay, now there's a little sliver of hope, you know? Now Attica, she actually texted me a few weeks ago. She's, she just pre-filed the bill for the next legislative session. Um, and I just feel like if there's anything this film says or it, that it did or that it could do is to really kind of like provide that hope and really hopefully like educate a lot of people about why this is, you know, an issue that's worth a bill. Um, so I think ultimately it's, you know, it's a lot about, it's a lot about hope. And I guess for both of you, last question, for people who are seeing your films for the very first time, is there anything that you want to make sure that they know that they may not have otherwise known before? Mm. Any unanswered questions, hot takes you can give me now. <laughs> I, I would just say, um, I, don't have any, I don't have anything in particular. I, I hope, I mean, we have the struggle of trying to, you know, our job is to try to take Ed's testimony, his own words, and present it in a you know, 12, 14 minute package. But I spoke with Ed, or really, Ed spoke to me for, I don't know, nine or 10 hours. We talked about his entire life story. Um, so even though, even though you're getting a piece of the story, it's only a piece and it's really kind of a reduced uh, reduced piece um, from from a filmmaker who's not from that community, um, from um, in a, on a timeline um, in 14 minutes, and so I would just encourage people to read more about Ed and read more about um, what happened there because it's a lot more rich and interesting than than we could ever put uh, in a short documentary. Stories always are, right? That's, that's, that's the hard part about being storytellers, the time, time limits. There's so much more you know, left to be said. What about you, Samantha? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to echo that. Um, you know, I, I always have to kind of give props to Attica. She's really, you know, I just gave her a platform, but she's an incredible leader in Kentucky, and she's sort of fearless and is you know, comes from this organizer background. And um, if people are interested, they should absolutely look her up and see what she's doing on the ground right now in Louisville. She just proposed, uh, she recently proposed um, her latest bill, Brianna's Law, um, which would, um, you know, which would ban no-knock warrants. Um, and she's really, she was, you know, she was just arrested for um, rioting, you know, during the Breonna Taylor protest. And so she's really doing a lot on the ground. And my film only follows like a tiny sliver of everything she does. 
Um, so yeah, I just think she's an amazing example of, of a leader right now. And uh, I just have to give her her props. Yeah, you two found some, some pretty interesting and incredible leaders. And I think we're better for seeing their stories. I want to thank you so much for joining us, both Ben and Samantha. And thank you all for watching. You can learn more about the Meet the Press Film Festival. Just go to NBCNews.com slash MTP Film Festival. We'll see you there.